So my name is Sarah Jordan. I am the Biosphere Business Partner Coordinator for North Devon UNESCO Biosphere. And I'm also the Nature Tourism Officer for our Biosphere and for Torridge District Council. Um, so the Biosphere and Torridge District Council have recently joined forces to drive forward the Council's uh, nature tourism agenda, which did include the remodelling of the Northern Boroughs Visitor Centre. If you haven't been there yet or visited since it was completed last July, um, please get down there. It's well worth a visit. Uh, so I'm delighted to introduce the wonderful Chris Brandt from Unmissable England, who is the founder and director of Unmissable England. He's going to be leading this session. So I'm going to hand over to Chris now and, and enjoy. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, good morning, everybody. Good to see you uh, with us this morning on this workshop on experiential tourism. Uh, just from me, first of all, at the very beginning, I just want to give you some context about myself and about Unmissable England and what we're all about. We're very much about authentic experiences. So the guys you see on the screen in front of you this morning are three of our experience makers uh, down in the Kent Downs area of outstanding natural beauty. These are just three of our experience makers uh, out of a collection of 85 across regional England that provide experiences that tell the story of our landscape, the people, the place, the food and drink, the history, the heritage, the wildlife and nature. So we've got some Indian cooking in the forest, we've got some forest bathing and foraging, and we've got an organic farmer providing uh, an experience on his farm. That's just some of the types of experiences that we support uh, tourism boards and destination management and projects and councils all across regional England. And you will hear me talk about regional England today because we're very much about bringing visitors out of the honeypots, out of the towns and cities, the well-known destinations that both domestic and international visitors already visit. We're about moving the, that, that, that visitor um, and finding out more authentic and unique experiences from the local people in less well-known places. We have a website, uh, unmissableengland.com. Please do go and check it out after the session today because it might inspire you to actually think about other experiences and things that you might want to develop uh, as a part of an, a nature experience uh, here across North Devon. So have a look around. We've got, as I say, 85 experiences, all different themes, different uh, kind of types of experiences, different lengths and durations and prices. Gives you an idea of what's out in the marketplace already. But as I say, we're very much about uh, supporting tourism businesses uh, across regional England, uh, whether that's a, an individual uh, looking to actually lead a, an experience to a small business looking to start experiential tourism. But first of all, what is experiential tourism and what's it all about? Let's start right at the very beginning this morning. So an experience is something that is very memorable. A tourism product is very much what you buy. But the tourism experience is what you will remember. And if you only remember one thing about this session today, and I hope there will be many different things that you'll take away, but remember this one slide. It's about creating really special, memorable experiences for your guests. Memories that your guests will take away, share with their family and friends, and post on Instagram and Facebook, and share that, that memory that they've had. So let me give you one example of that. The pictures on the screen right now are of an experience up in the Peak District National Park. And this is one of the experiences that I worked on previously when I worked for the national parks. And on this experience, you go behind the scenes of a privately owned stately home at Haddon Hall, uh, right near Bakewell in the, in the National Park. And you get to step into the, 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 the kitchen and scullery and you get to make bread um, using one of the oldest ovens in England. So a really special experience a really special memory that you create uh, that's created in that experience. So whatever your experience might be that you're looking to develop, make sure it's got something in there that's going to make sure that your guests have got memories to go home and tell all their family and friends about a long time after. So experiential tourism is very much a brand new layer of opportunities for businesses and individuals uh, beyond the traditional tourism landscape. So, you know, you might already be a tour guide and you might have your tours uh, on offer. You might have a range of different goods and services. 
But experiential tourism is another layer. And I'll, I'll go into, into detail about that in our next few slides so you can really understand what those layers are. But the experience is very much the product is what you sell. So guests more and more, whether they in from the UK or from abroad, are looking for bookable experiences that they can see all of the information. They know when it starts, when it finishes, how much it costs, how many people um, they take, and they can click on that and they can book it. And you know, as the experience host, exactly when they're going to come and visit and take part in your experience. But experiences are very much about those local stories, culture, wildlife, nature, all of those things connecting people with the place um, and and you, you, you're very much a part of that experience. There are four main components of any type of experience. And I'm gonna take you through those four main components now. First up is the resources. So these are our natural assets. So I'm talking about the countryside. I'm talking about the, 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 the North Devon biosphere, uh, biosphere. I'm talking about the whole nature there are pretty towns and villages, are, are um, rights of way of access through footpaths and cycle routes. These are on our doorstep. These are for you to, to use and bring guests. Um, so already you have the great natural resources on your doorstep. So that's one tick, one component ready and done. The next component are the goods. So these are traditionally more of the the traditional tourism uh, businesses like accommodation providers and I know we've got a few on the call this morning so you might be looking to collaborate and work with uh, other experiences and look to kind of see how you can work in collaboration and partnership. You might already be an attraction uh, like a farm park or or uh, you know a museum and looking to work with um, others in developing an experience or you might be an activity provider. So we've got the resources, the goods, and then we've got the services. And this is more your type of uh, bike hire, cycle hire company, tour guide. You might already be delivering tours uh, already across the area and looking to see how you can actually branch out into experiential tourism. And the fourth and final uh, component is the local stories and the people. And that's really, really important because you want to bring to life all those things that you know as a local person or as a local business and bring that, con that context, that story to life in all of, of your experiences. And what we see time after time is when you connect the resources, the goods, the services, the local people and those really important stories, when you connect them all together, that's what makes a really good experience. And you're gonna hear me talk about a lot of partnership working and collaboration because often we find businesses can't do all of this on their own and they might need to work in collaboration with a, you know a, a local cafe or a restaurant or cycle hire company uh, and that's really great to, to see that work coming across and joining up to create these really immersive experiences um, that are really good quality and leave your guests with a really good understanding of the place that they have visited. So um, where 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 is um, experiential tourism come from? Is it something that's been talked about? It's very much the trend at the moment here in the UK, but it has existed around the world for for many years. So the Canadians, the uh, the Canadian Tourism Commission, were one of the first leaders about 10, 15 years ago, and they really spent a lot of time and research studying experiential tourism and seeing how it can work and how it can really support businesses across Canada and from there it has grown into America, Australia and further afield and in the last five years here in the UK it's really uh, boosted uh, and more and more businesses across the country are taking advantage of the structure of experiential tourism because it does so many good things and one of those things is the economic value so we're not here just to do it as because it's been nice for our visitors or this is sustainable tourism. We're doing this because it has real potential for economic growth for your business. Let me give you an example of that. Uh, on the screen, we've got a vineyard business. Now this can be applied to any type of business. Uh, it doesn't have to be a vineyard, but I'm gonna give you an example if you were a vineyard business and how actually experiential tourism can really help you grow your business. So first of all, uh, in our chart there on the right hand side, you'll see uh, our resources. So if you're a vineyard business, 
your vineyard, the actual grapes that you produce, are your resource. So you've got your resource on the doorstep. Next, you're going to obviously produce and bottle wine, uh, and that's something that you do in your core business. Now, for some vineyard business, we obviously see that some of you are actually providing wine tasting experiences. Um, you know, so some of our vineyards, I should say, are, are producing um, and actually have services like wine tasting and taking guests around um, their vineyard. And for many tourism businesses and vineyard businesses, that's where they get to. They get to maybe doing a, a guided tour um, at their venue, at their premises, in their businesses. And that's not experiential tourism yet. It's only when you join up all of those things that you actually start making an experience. So if we go back to the components of looking at the resources, the goods, services, it's when we join those together, we see actually you can go and have guests and they can learn about the vineyard, they can pick the grapes, they can press the grapes, they can do things all year round on a vineyard. They can help bottle the wine, label the wine, go behind the scenes and see how it's actually done in the production line and have a go. They still get to do that really important part and that's drinking and tasting the wine, but why not pair it up with local cheeses or other foods, have a lunch, take your guests to the local pub and have a, have a, a, have a dinner with the, the wine. So it's all of those things, it's joining all that up together to create a fully immersive, authentic experience that it's got so much more value uh, in that experience than just a tour around. So economically, you can charge a lot more for your experience. Um, therefore, it's good for your business. And as I say, this can be applied to any type of business. You don't have to be a vineyard to offer this experience uh, or, or, or work in this structure. Um, so if you are a business and you have you know, a venue, a location, um, and you're doing, you know, you have your resource, but you have your goods, think about how you can join that up and how you can offer your, your visitors, your potential visitors, to go behind the scenes and have a go at your, your, um, what, what you do in your experience. So let me give you some really good examples now um, of really what makes uh, an experience different to your classic tour and I should say at this point I'm not saying if you run tours or anybody else that you know you, there's, there's plenty really good tours around there and I think tours actually exist in the marketplace you know alongside experiences so if you are a tour guide or you work with tour guides you know don't rip up the, the, the tour guide book that that's great we're not saying that we're saying that exists in the marketplace but why not branch out and offer experiences as well let me give you one of our examples of an experience now. So these four guys, uh, this picture, should I say, was taken back in 2019, just before the pandemic. These guys, two couples from Seattle in the United States of America, and they have pre-booked this experience around about four months before traveling to the UK. This experience is baking scones in a Cotswold thatch cottage. And it says what it does on the tin, basically. So these guys have booked that experience. It's £68 per person. They've paid up front, they've clicked book on the website, and they have they know exactly where they're going and how much it costs. And it's a two and a half hour experience baking scones. But it's much more than that. So I'll take you through what guests will do. They step into a privately owned thatch cottage on the very edge of the Cotswolds. We're not talking about a honeypot location. It's not a well-known destination. It's the type of place in the village where the, uh, the, the other residents are saying, what are Americans doing here? How do, they, how do they get here? How do they know about this? So it's really special. It's off the beaten track. So we're not trying to, again, not trying to talk about well-known des destinations having even more visitors. We're talking about less well-known places, but having these authentic experiences. So these four guys, they step into a privately owned thatch cottage, they get to meet the owners, they get to have a cup of tea uh, in the China and all that kind of very much kind of quintessentially English experience, but they get to understand and learn about the history and heritage of the cottage. So the cottage has been going under uh, almost 10 years of restoration work. It's only a small cottage, but it's 16th century with a thatch um, in the local stone. So you hear from the, uh, the owners who have been doing lovingly restoring this thatch cottage uh, and you get to hear about how they've done the lime plaster and all the different things and the, and the wood and everything like that and bringing that to life. 
So they have their cup of tea, they hear about that, they hear about the ancestry as well of the cottage going right back to 1841 because the owners have gone back using census information to understand what, what the families used to do uh, in living in those cottages because it was actually uh, two cottages I should say. So two cottages uh, and there was a, a real history with um, farming in that area so there's some really nice stories about farming. Then the guests get to step into the cottage's kitchen and then they get to bake scones using a traditional family recipe. And this is when they get their hands-on experience uh, actually making the scones, using the old utensils in the kitchen. Lots of Instagram moments. Again, really important to have that uh, Instagram moment so your guests can actually take a picture of what they're doing, share it on Facebook and Instagram, etc. And that helps you promote your experience even further as well. Now, once these guys have made their scones and they're baking in the oven um, and they're, they're, they're cooling down after that, the host then takes them out of the cottage into the village and does a short guided walk around the village, bringing the village stories to life, understanding about um, how, how the village was there in the first place, the industries that went on. And then you visit a 13th century uh, ironstone church and step into that church and understand more about the history and the connections there and the culture but then you get to see the remains of a 14th century castle mm -hmm. where James the first um, visited not once but uh, actually he stayed uh, not not once but twice Oliver Cromwell also visited so some links there to some bigger history and for, for international guests going forward, when we properly get them returning, they really love these big history stories, as well as the local history and unknown stories. So if you have an experience that you have links to big history and big well-known facts, that's great, but also include some of that really local stuff, some of the myths and legends and kind of things that you know in your area. So once these guys return back to the cottage, they've had their guided tour around the village and then as you see before you on the screen there the cream tea with the scones that they have made themselves are laid out and they can enjoy the, the, uh, the cream tea with a nice pot of tea and every time there's always the conversation is it scone or scone does the cream go on first does the jam go on first wherever people are from in the world they always have that conversation when enjoying their scones they get to take any scones away uh, with them back home or back to their cottage or, or back to their South Catering uh, uh, location um, and they get to take a recipe card back with them as well. Now I know this experience pretty well because it's actually one of my own experiences. Um, this is my house, uh, I live in Oxfordshire, just on the very edge of the Cotswolds uh, area of outstanding natural beauty. And I set up this experience about four or five years ago when I stepped into experiential tourism and I thought, well, it's no good me advising businesses all across uh, England actually how to do experiences if I'm not doing it myself. So I love doing this experience. I had two, two groups on Saturday and Sunday, the weekend just gone. Uh, both groups were from America again. So you know, it's really good to see international tourism is starting to pick up um, as we kind of very slowly uh, come out of the pandemic. Um, but these guests, um, they, they, they're coming back and they fall in love with this experience because we, we are able to, you know, we've got a, a small little cottage, but we've been restoring it. And it's great to share our story with guests from across the UK and, and around the world. And going back to that question, what's different from a classic tour to an experience? So it's very much the people. So in this experience, um, the guests get to meet the owner of the cottage. So you're not just visiting a museum or, or a place, you're actually going to connect with the people. They also get to meet some of the people in the village as well, um, passing by. So there's a real good connection to the people. So if you, on your experience, if you, you know, you might be running a brewery or you might have, you might be a farmer, it's your story of how you have done your work or how you have passion in what you do and it's about sharing that so any any story about you or the people you work with or the people that you know you, you've got connections with feed that into your experience because that will give you that real connection with your guests 
There's also the other way as well, because guests are also going to be sharing about where they're from, about you know their country, their cultures, their traditions as well. It's a two-way process. It's not just you relaying lots of stories and information. Your guests are going to be sharing and saying, oh, we've got something similar in the, you know wherever they're from. So the people aspect is really important. And as I said, links to big history as well, that well-known figures and the royal family and historian uh, characters are quite nice to also link into that. So people, place is, an, is the second element. So on this experience, guests get to step into, you know, my cottage. My cottage isn't open to the public. It's no way, not a national trust property or anything like that. So if you have an experience where you can have your guests going into, it doesn't need to be your house, but if it's going off the beaten track, going behind the scenes of a museum, going behind the scenes of a brewery, going, having some a special access will really add value to your experience. So in your experience, you might be taking them through you know, a privately owned farm to get to a special piece of woodland or forest. Because um, you, know, you might be working with the local landowner, the local farmer to have that special access. Therefore, if you, if you can create an experience that guests simply cannot do by themselves, you are off to a winner because that will add real value to your experience. So today we're talking very much about nature experiences, wildlife experiences, experiences across the landscape so if you know you know you work with a local person you know who does lots of wildlife work conservation or you know a landowner you should be speaking to them and seeing how you can have special access or go off the beaten track um, to actually add value into your experience but you don't necessarily need to do that because sometimes it's just your local knowledge as a local expert as a local person taking them to uh, you know, your favourite footpath, taking them to your favourite woodland. Um, as visitors, they might just not know about it unless they're really into Ordnance Survey maps and they know exactly where they're going. Um, but actually you guiding them and taking them to your favourite spots is also going off the beaten track, especially if they're less well-known locations. So that's, that's place. Um, and it's really important to think about where you're taking them. And our final element of this is very much the participation. And for me, this really makes it different from a classic tour because you want your guests to have hands-on activity. So in my case or my experience, I'm not just standing there and making scones with them. I'm not just serving them scones and you know, saying, have a nice cream tea. I'm saying to my guests, here's the recipe, here's the ingredients. Um, I'm gonna take you through how to make scones using my family recipe. Um, and we're going to have a lot of fun doing that, by the way. Um, so actually, in your experience, you want your guests to have hands on activity where they can actually participate in as many activities as possible. So, you know, having a guided walk is also part of an activity, but why not give them to do some, uh, you know, depending on what time of year it is, monitor, monitoring some butterflies on your walk. Um, and actually, you know, having a, a clipboard and a pen and actually go through and say, well, today, you know, what, what can you see? What can you see? What butterflies can you see? Um, there's many different things, you know, that we can actually recommend. And we'll, we'll talk about this, especially in our next workshop, actually, the different types of activities that you can do in nature experiences. Um, so having that hands-on activity, and we see this again and again, more and more guests are looking for hands-on activity. They don't want to be spoken at. They don't want to just be told lots and lots of information and bombarded with information. They want some information. They want to try something. They want to do something that's really different to what they normally um, would do. And you know, the more you can add into that, you're adding value to your experience. That will really help you with your pricing and make your experience authentic and unique and stand out in the marketplace as well. So people, place and participation, my three Ps uh, for you to remember. And if you hope, hopefully we're gonna see you in our next workshop, uh, which is our physical workshop later in the month. Um, and we will go and drill down much more in detail about people, place and participation. And I'll be getting you to think actually about how that works for your own experiences. Now here's my five top tips in creating a really good experience. Um, so 
again, um, lots of takeaway here for you to think about um, in those five steps. So uh, I'm going to take you through them one by one. So number one, it's the story, the context of your, your experience. And for me, it has to be your own story. It's no good telling somebody else a story or reading lots of information about lots of different facts and things that you found on the internet. That is not your own experience. That's not sharing. And you're not going to connect well with your visitor. So it's got to be something that you're passionate about, that you understand, you, you love, that you do, um, you've, that you have researched and you know really well, and you own that story. That's really important. Let me give you an example of that. This is Kevin, who's based up in uh, Hadrian's Wall, or, or should I say near Hadrian's Wall, uh, in Northumberland National Park. And he's one of the businesses that I've worked with previously. Um, and on his experience, um, you go out and you live like a Roman. And that's actually the name of his experience. It's live like a Roman. And he's dressed up as a Roman soldier, even that he looks a bit like a, a Viking to me. Um, but he actually takes his guests out uh, and really interprets the landscape, the geology, the whole history and heritage of the fabulous Hadrian's Wall and of that spot of the National Park. Now, Kevin has chosen to dress up as a Roman, but you don't need to dress up to tell a story. <laughs> it's just, you know, he, he likes doing that and he does it particularly well as well. Um, so, you know, don't, don't sit there thinking, oh my goodness, I've got to dress up to tell my story. That's not what we're saying. If you want to, go ahead. Um, but for Kevin, he he finds that adds real value to his experience. And it, it really, his guests really receive that well. So he goes out in costume as a Roman soldier, brings to life all those stories, all that information that he studied. You get to eat and drink like a Roman soldier. Uh, and I can tell you, I've tried this and um, it's not particularly the nicest food and drink that you'll ever try but it is fully immersive and real. So it would have been what you would have eaten like a Rome, as a Roman soldier. So really authentic, really special. You can't do this anywhere else. You can have your own walk along Hadrian's Wall, but you just wouldn't be getting this type of uh, experience that Kevin is providing. This is about a three hour experience, I should say as well. So whatever your experience is, make sure you have a story and own that story. And like all good stories, have a good start, middle and end. So in those, those points, the start, middle and end, make sure they're real high points in your journey of your experience. So this is, might be when you have your activities or show your guests a big wide open view that they can fall in love with and take pictures of. Um, so in you know, you're creating those emotional connections in your experience and thinking about those real high points in your story. But as I say, this should be your story. And what we'll do in our next workshop, in our, in our workshop, uh, half day workshop in person, we will drill down and look at those rural stories, those coastal stories, those nature stories, and actually look across North Devon and the Torridge district and really drill down. What are the stories? What are, what are the well-known stories that we know really well? What are those really local stories that only you know as a local or as a local business? What's the myths and legends? What's all those historical li links? What are the cultural links? And actually, it might be some little information that, you know, that's really particular to one area, one you know, piece of woodland or one village. And bringing out those stories can actually theme your experience. So number one, story is important. And number two, include everything. So there's no awkward moments on your experience. We're not asking you to get your wallet out halfway through an experience and say, are you paying for that pint? Are you going to, you know, in the bar, are you going to get your wallet out? When your guests book, they book for everything included in your experience. Now, we really encourage you to use, obviously, locally sourced food and drink from across the district and across the area. So where possible, if you're going over a mealtime, over lunch or dinner, include locally sourced food and drink. Now you might be providing a picnic lunch, you might be having fish and chips on the beach, you might be taking guests to a local restaurant or a local pub, but make sure you're including that pricing in your experience. And what you will need to do when you develop your experience is negotiate with that local landlord or get a really good price 
on those lunches and say, actually, I'm bringing guests to you. I'm going to pay uh, ahead or I'm going to pay uh, after we've had our meal. Um, can you give me a bit of discount? Because I'm going to be bringing traffic to your business um, and that will help you with your margins as well. Or you might just be simply saying, actually, we're just going to include uh, this boat trip, uh, you know, this, and it's five pounds, you know, for the day to hire this little dinghy. Uh, and actually that's included as well. Or you might be visiting a local museum and you know, there's a donation to enter. So you're actually including that donation into your pricing. But when you're doing that on your experience information in your marketing on your websites, when you sell these experiences, you'll need to identify all those things, all those advantages that your guests are getting, all those different aspects of it. So they really understand that value of that experience and what they're getting. And we're seeing more and more that visitors are wanting uh, businesses and uh, these experiences to actually take them to the best places, to take them to the best restaurants and have the best picnic and things like that, because they rely on you as the local, as the expert, to actually take them to the best places because they, they don't want to, they, they're lazy. They don't want to do all that research and Googling to find out actually uh, those best places. They, they're, they're paying you to do that and to be taken to those places as well. So whatever your experience, include everything from bike hire to any food and drink uh, and make sure you price that in your experience. At number three, it's the unexpected. So a real surprise element in your experience. So whatever your experience, think about what unexpected element you could actually include. This could be uh, a little nugget of information, you know, a, a short story within your bigger story about something that was just unexpected, or it could be an activity uh, where actually it's a bit of a surprise in your experience that your guests might have not been known, uh, thinking about that they might be doing. Let me give you some examples of that. This is one of our experiences up in the Yorkshire Dales. Uh, it's a cave experience. So you go through some caves um, and a beautiful location. And about 45 minutes into the car, uh, cave system, our experienced host here in the picture uh, kneels down uh, in the middle of the cave and you've got, a, you've got a pool of water down there and looks down into the pool of water and says, did you know back in 1984, there was a real live crocodile in this pool of water. And the group's there scratching their head thinking, really, <laughs> are you serious? We're in Yorkshire. Um, why would there be a crocodile uh, at any time, not just in, in 1984, but um, why would there be a crocodile in the middle of the cave system 45 minutes in? Um, so really, really unexpected. Um, but actually when, when he tells a story, it was ITV uh, back in 1984, filming a drama series uh, which involved um, a crocodile and they were making out that the it wasn't in Britain it was somewhere else but they transported this real live crocodile into the cave system and put it into the, uh, this this water and obviously you know it, it was getting cold and the crocodile was cold da, da, da. anyway the long and short of it it was a really unexpected story and I still remember it now and I'm sharing it with you. So whatever your experience is, have some unexpected stories that your guests just wouldn't have known before visiting. So you can, again, it's adding that value into your experience. So little nuggets of information. Or you might want to add in something that's more activity-based that's unexpected. So we've got an experience up in the Lake District on Lake Windermere. And as we know, if you've been to Lake Windermere, there's a lot of things to do. There's lots of tourism products to do on and off the lake. So when I was working for the national parks, then we worked with the national park rangers to actually develop an experience on their national park uh, ranger patrol boats. So they have a, uh, a duty of care on, on, on the lake to actually make sure everybody's uh, behaving, no one's speeding and everybody's safe as well. So they have a small patrol boat. And we looked at actually how to offer a really different experience, a different product on, on Lake Windermere. And we created a, you know, an experience where you go out with the national park ranger on the patrol boat and you get to patrol as a national park ranger, um, Lake Windermere. So really fun, you get to have special access to some of the little remote islands uh, on the lake that only the national park uh, uh, rangers have access to because there's lots of conservation work uh, going on there. So you get to kind of dock uh, onto those islands 
But the real unexpected element of that experience is that you are really going to be the ranger for the day because they get you to drive the boat. Now, I've done this experience and the first time, I, you know, I, it's only a tiny boat, so it takes up to about four or five people, so quite a small experience. And, you know, obviously they're driving the boat, they're giving you all this information, you're docking the island, you have a fantastic picnic, and then you take the steering wheel, you are then driving that boat, you get to dock onto the islands, you get to do a man overboard as well, uh, with, with a dummy, I should say, at that point. Really unexpected, really great memories and some great Instagram moments as well, things that you'll go back and share and tell others. So whatever your experience is, create stories that are unexpected or create activities that are unexpected as well. It will add value to your experience. As well as the unexpected, it's also good to include some of the expected elements in your experience as well. So don't be afraid to be uh, Devonshire, quintessentially English or British, some of these wholesome good things uh, that makes you know our culture, our food and drink are great to have. Um, sometimes seen as a bit of a cliche, uh, but actually if they're done well, uh, so you know taking uh, a group to have a ploughman's lunch in a traditional English inn uh, with really good locally sourced food and drink is good. It's, it's quintessentially English. Our American guests, our international guests when they return, absolutely love it but so do us brits um, we love to be taken to these places and in front of a cozy fire in the winter and have fish and chips uh, locally sourced um, and be taken that to those places so don't be afraid to include some of those things as long as they fit into that wider context of your story um, to make sure it connects into you know it's on a route of a nature walk you know and there's a fantastic pub they do local ale they do locally sourced food and drink that will fit well into my experience, that will fit well into the story. So whatever it is, uh, make sure you include some of those expected things because that will really enhance your experience when you get to market it as well. Because especially during the pandemic, we've all missed these, these things of having fish and chips on the beach and things like that. And if you can include them in your experience, I think you're off to you know, a good start. And at number five, keep it simple and be flexible. And I can't say that enough. A lot of businesses go off after this workshop and they will then uh, have so many ideas and be really creative. And that's great, that's what we, that's what we like to see. Uh, but don't include too many elements that your experience becomes just too complicated or too expensive to actually run. If you're already running experiences or tours, you will know every visitor every group is completely different. So you will need to build in some flexibility into your experience. So if you have a group of people that are particularly walking a lot slower uh, in your experience, then you might not get to A, B, C or D as quick as you had planned to. So you'll need to actually adjust your timing in your head and think actually we need to spend a bit shorter here or, or I need to do a bit less talking. Just having that approach and, and being ready to be flexible will help you. Also, you might have a group of people that are just not talking and they're just walking really quickly and they're looking at everything and they're not interacting particularly well. And you might just need to think, actually, I might need to um, you know, go this way through this woodland and do that and, and actually adjust it slightly. Also, um, you might have groups of people that actually say, hey, I really want to be, uh, you know, I'm just visiting the area for a day and I really love to go and see this spot or see this viewpoint or see this or go there. Um, and actually you might just tweak and tailor your experience slightly for that group or for that guest. So don't be afraid to do that. Also, if you are looking in the future to work with the, the, the industry, with the travel trade and actually sell your experiences here in the UK or abroad in the future, um, then these tour operators and the travel trade that you might work with will really ask you to be really flexible with your experience and think about, you know, shorter in it or making it longer or changing the price slightly. So as you develop your experience, it's good to always have a really flexible approach with your experience you know have, have have it certain of what your experience is what your story is but just be flexible how you deliver it let me give you another example of a really great experience this is up in the peak district um, and this is one of my favorite experiences 
uh, in the Peak District. And this is, um, you might be familiar with this actually, um, it's been on telly um, twice in the last week alone, uh, but this is the Blue John Stone Caves um, experience um, in Castleton, right in the heart of the National Park. And on this experience, um, so I should say they've been caving uh, the Blue Johnstone Caves, the Tree Cavern Caves, uh, for generations. It's the same family that links back, going back for over 100 years. And these guys have been offering tours and uh, school groups, uh, uh, tours uh, for many years, charging anything about eight, eight pounds, 12 pounds per person. So quite, quite low in the product range. Now these guys continue running their tours. And as I was saying earlier on, it's important to really say, actually, you know, we're not saying cancel all tours. Tours are tours, right? The right tours are, you know, are good and they can work, but actually offering another product range next to a tour can actually enhance what you do uh, and the, the, the value, the, the growth of your business. So these guys offer those tours, but now they offer the Blue John Stone experience. And on this experience, you still get to go obviously into the cave system and you get to go around with a guide, but you're not in a big group we're talking small groups. And this again makes an experience really different from a tour because we recommend, you know, your group sizing should be anything from one to up to 12. We're not talking big groups of coach parties, mass tourism. We are talking really authentic small groups. So they get to really know you, you really get to know them um, and they get to know each other as well. So a small group of people, so already we're adding value into the experience on this in, in the Blue John Stones example, because there's not 20 of us, there, there could be four of us, there could be eight of us. And we're going around the, the caves and then you get to actually mine a piece of Blue John Stone yourself. So this is our first hands-on activity that I was talking about, your participation. This Blue John Stone is the only type of, of that stone that can be found anywhere in the world. So it's really unique, really special. And you get to mine a piece. Now I, I should say, it's not always gonna be as big as your hand. Um, my piece of stone, which I've got here, uh, there we go, but if you can see that, there we go, because I've done this experience, believe it or not. Uh, you get to mine a piece and you get to take this piece of stone home, this really special piece of Blue John stone. Uh, and I should say there's plenty of it as well. Um, uh, so then you get to, to do that, but then you get to then polish that piece of stone in their workshop. So another activity. So you've got the, the caving, the mining, and then you get to, get to polish that piece of stone. But not only that, you then get to actually make that piece of stone into a piece of jewellery, uh, also in the workshop. Um, and of course, you get to take that piece of jewellery home as well. So a really nice all-round experience, the people, place and participation, really clear in that experience. The family there with a generational link to the cave system. The lady there you can see is called Vicky. It's her family that's been generations uh, mining the, the Blue Johnstone Caves. Um, and because it's quite a lengthy experience, so we're talking about seven hours, lunch, a locally sourced lunch, picnic lunch is included, teas and coffees and interpretation of the geology, the geography and the landscape is all included into that experience. So you go away um, feeling educated, but not, not kind of like you've been to school, <laughs> but you're informed uh, informally. So you, you have a better understanding of the place that you visit um, and understand what they do there in that experience. For me, that's an all round good experience, um, something uh, that we can all learn a lot from. Obviously, we don't all have cave systems, so um, we're not all going to be able to do this type of experience, but it gives you the kind of structure that we're looking for when developing your nature experiences. So let's, let me give you some more case study examples. I'm going to take you around the country um, and, and locally as well of some of the experiences that are in the marketplace at the moment that are doing particularly well. Um, obviously, with COVID, um, some of our experiences in the marketplace were kind of set up for international guests um, and obviously we've adapted more to the staycation market um, across the country, well all countries have I should say, but that international um, visitor is, is, is returning, as I was saying just last weekend on my own experience, 
I had two groups um, from different parts in the US. So we are starting to see a trickle uh, of guests returning from around the world. The first experience is up, uh, sorry, down in, uh, it's in the Kent Downs area of outstanding natural beauty. This is a new experience that I've worked with the team in the Kent Downs. Uh, and this is one where you go forest bathing and have a, a wild tea walk. Uh, this is a three hour experience. For me, it's really great value. It's 40 pounds her a person. So you get to go out of a local, but she's also an expert. She knows about forest bathing. She understands about foraging as well. She, you know, she, she's qualified as well. And you've got that tea walk in there as well. And she brings the whole story of that experience to life. Three hours, 40 pounds, 40 pounds, I should say, is a really good price point for the domestic audience. Us Brits, we don't like to spend too much on our activities when we go on holiday. Um, these are prices per person. Um, we tend to pay around about that kind of £40 mark for three hours, £60 for like kind of five, four or five hours, I would say. The further you are away from the place that you visit, the more that you like to kind of spend on an experience. So if you are coming from Germany, or France or America, then it's likely that you actually spend a bit more on that experience. Um, and actually, uh, because it's a bigger travel, you, you're committing to, you know, going on holiday, you're, you're paying, uh, you know, your travel fee. Therefore, you want to have a really great time and you're looking to book um, a higher price experience. So that's really good information for now, knowing that mostly the experiences um, that you'd be running will, you know, in the next year or so, will be mostly for domestic audiences or even local audiences. So your pricing point is really important. So I do there, forest bathing, a wild tea walk, a nice experience uh, with a local there. And then taking you uh, to Northumberland, uh, this is a foraging and wild cooking experience. Now you don't necessarily need to be an expert in all your experiences. Uh, going back to my scone making expert, I'm not yeah, sorry, experienced. I'm not a, um, a baker, um, a professional baker. I'm not a chef, but I am a home baker. Uh, I love baking um, and that's OK. I'm very clear about that in my marketing. Um, I'm very clear about that when guests come and visit. Um, I'm sharing my favourite family recipe of scones with them. So you don't necessarily need to be always be an expert in your experience. You can be sharing your own understanding, your own experience within your experience. But there are some experiences where you will need to be an expert or in some cases qualified to do what you do. And foraging is one of those things. You, you need to be, you know, making sure that you're, you're not picking something um, that shouldn't be picked, for example, or, or, or what have you. So do get advice make sure you are uh fully you know covered uh, and uh, i'm sorry uh, have a full understanding of what you're doing uh before you go and actually go and venture out into your experience and having a you know somebody a professional is also adds value to your experience as well as somebody who has good experience as well depending on the experience so this is a, a 60 pounds uh experience it's slightly more expensive for the three hours uh, and you go around uh, again uh, foraging and you have a, a lunch uh, from the food that you have foraged. So this is a professional foraging company uh, that works really closely with the team in the National Park as well. So there's that kind of joined up approach and collaboration. Uh, taking you not too far away, just in uh, still in Devon, um, this is in Exmoor National Park. Uh, this is Liz who takes her group out. Uh, this is an evening experience and we've really seen uh, a few more uh, evening experiences taking place actually because a lot, a lot of things to do um, are bookable uh, you know, only in the day um, and actually having something in the evening is really great because visitors are still around, they're still looking for things to do. So in this experience, Liz takes them to her local kind of church and they can have a bat detector and they're looking for, for, for the bats. They then uh, fire up uh, the wood uh, oven and then they make their own stone baked um, pizzas as well, as well as doing all that bat, uh, bat watching and with a bat detector as well. Uh, Liz tends to do it per group. So um, you can have about eight people for 200 pounds for two hours but she also does it per person. And she does many other uh, experiences across North Devon 
and Exmoor as well, I should say. Um, so an even experience, uh, if you're really busy in the day, uh, going forward in the spring and summer, you might be thinking actually, hmm, I might do a, an experience in the evening. Probably good to include food and drink if you're doing an evening so that guests are not having to think about eating before or after. It's something that you're already covering. Uh, and that, again, gives it more value in your experience. Or it could be an experience that you're opening up premises that are not normally open in or uh, in, in, the, in the evening. It's just open in the daytime. Mm -hmm. Again, you're creating that special visitor access, that special off the beaten track experience that guests can do after the site closes to the general public at five o'clock. You know, you reopen at half past six, seven o'clock and you're given uh, ac special access to that particular group. Again, it's a good, uh, good, good idea that you could be adding value to what you do. And then from Exmoor down to the South Downs, down to Sussex, this is Rich, who is an expert. He's an expert hiker and professional uh, in doing that. He runs experiences and tours on mountains and all around the world, including the Lake District. Uh, but Rich, uh, this is his home, Sussex, um, and he has developed this fantastic experience, Hills, Hops and Hampers. Um, and he takes you out four hours he brings to life the story of the ancient woodland, the classic rolling hills in Surrey, uh, sorry, in Sussex. Um, and he talks about everything that you see, the geology, the landscape, and brings that to life. So you don't need to be, uh, you know, a conservationist uh, to understand or, or what Rich is talking about. He, it's a very much an experience for everybody. It's not a niche experience. But then he brings together a fantastic picnic um, and I'm really lucky enough I've, I've done this experience as well and you have a picnic uh, that he's he's put together and he's um, sourced all those, those different things so you've got pasties and pork pies and quiches and salad all locally sourced from local bakers and farms around that area and then after your lunch you then visit an award-winning independent microbrewery uh, where you have a tour and then you do some ale tasting as well um, again a really good experience connecting the landscape to food and drink understanding the, the the landscape better and then having some beer tasting working in collaboration with another business as well four hours 65 pounds per person a good price again for that domestic audience going forward um, a really attractive offer and and also you know you're buying into all of um rich's uh, professional knowledge and also local knowledge of that area as well. So you leave knowing so much more about the area that you visited. So that's some of our uh, case study information that we um, we kind of put together uh, across the country. I'm going to give you a bit more information on some of our experiential sorry, experiential tourism trends. So this is data from us at uh, Missable England uh, over the last 12 months. These are different trends that we're seeing uh, how UK visitors want to book um, uh, going forward and the types of experiences that, that they're looking to book. We know that more and more visitors are looking to escape from their own towns and cities. Uh, and when doing so, they want to learn something new. But when they're doing that, they really want to reconnect with the great outdoors and nature. So again, really good opportunity for you or your business to actually tap into some of these things. Guests want to improve their health, mental health and well-being when doing an experience, but they also want to have that sense of feeling really refreshed after they've done their experience. They also want to go off the beaten track, um, as we were saying before, going to places that are less well known uh, or places that you know really well, it's your favourite walk or it's your favourite view, um, going somewhere that other people just aren't around is, is, is a good thing at the moment. It's kind of a, an outcome of um, COVID. They want to immerse themselves in the local culture and the history and the art. So they want to have, go away with a better understanding. But often they want to share with their friends and family uh, with an experience. So they don't want to just come on their own or just a couple. They might be bringing a fa their family with them. They might be intergeneral family as well. So they might be catching up from different places in the country and actually using your experience to actually reconnect. And then they want to explore freely, which can often be a bit of a challenge in an experience because we're talking about 
guided experiences. Um, so where you are always there in the experience or somebody is always there in the experience leading it and hosting it. So actually having that sense of freedom um, can sometimes be difficult. But I really encourage you when you're doing your experience to allow your guests to have some free time as well. Five, ten minutes here and there just to enjoy a view, to take in the view, to, to to use their senses to actually explore freely as well. You're still providing that, that, that you, you, you know, you're still the host. You're not gonna disappear for, for an hour or anything like that. You're not gonna leave them on their own, but you're just kind of pushing yourself to the back and allowing them just to feel that they can really uh, experience what they're experiencing, allow them that time. That also gives you a bit of a breather because you can then think, oh, okay, I've been talking too much now. And that also allows them to talk a bit more um, and also just enjoy what they're doing. And really importantly, businesses are looking to support, sorry, uh, visitors are looking to support local businesses. Um, again, a real big outcome of COVID. We all like to support local pubs and shops and restaurants and local businesses more than ever. So actually, if you're working in collaboration with a local business and you are a local business, then again, you know, people more and more are looking to support you. Now, we're not expecting you to go away and include all of these trends in your experience because there's far too many, but this should help you uh, when you're going away, looking at your experiences and how you can actually, you know, what you want uh, to achieve out of it, what you want your guests, how you want your guests to feel. Um, these are really good takeaways um, to think about how you, how you can do that now, how you can actually implement that into your new nature experiences. We're coming towards the end of the workshop um, and do feel free to um, put in any questions into the chat because Sarah and I will be looking through those questions and answering them uh, later on. So if there are things coming up that you would like to ask us, please do uh, pop them into the chat window uh, and we'll come on to them shortly. But before that, I want to cover uh, about bookability. So it's all very well having these experiences uh, developed and you've spent a lot of time and thinking time and uh, practical time in actually designing them and creating them. But you need to make sure that they're bookable and they're available for guests wherever they might be in the UK or wherever they might be in the world, that they, are, that they can find them and they can book them. So back before COVID, back in 2019, uh, this is data from Visit Britain, so the National Tourist Board. And this is very much on experiential holidays uh, in the UK before COVID. We have two columns. One is the UK domestic audience, uh, and the second is the inbound market, which is the international market. If we take the yellow section, first of all, these are the percentages of people or visitors that first of all chose the experience and then they found the destination. So these are people like Google, these are the Googlers, these are the people sitting down mm -hmm. uh, watching telly in the evening and they're thinking, oh, I really love to go in on, on a boat trip and see some dolphins or, or, or watch some seals or what have you, or, 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 or you know, go to an ancient woodland and, and experience um, what have you. So these are the people looking for those types of themes of those stories of those experiences. So 22% of the UK market and 17% of the international market. This is before the pandemic. We've all had two years at home, um, mostly, and sat at home thinking about what we would like to do. We've all been watching these programmes where celebrities and well-known people go around the UK and they tell us back at home, sitting in, you know, not going to be able to go out, telling how fantastic Devon is. Um, and, and often these celebrities are not just visiting the place, they're having all these fantastic experiences. Um, it's just that some of these experiences are, are not real for everybody to do at the moment. So actually this 22% and 17%, uh, we are expecting that to grow a lot. So again, having these really unique, authentic experiences will bring people to you because they really stand out. Um, people will choose your experience and come to North Devon um, rather than actually thinking about, I'm just going to go to Cornwall, I'm just going to go to Norfolk. Um, they're actually thinking about what they're going to experience when they're there. And then the section in the middle, the purple, uh, these are the visitors that chose the destination because of the experience that they were going to do. So 37% of the domestic market, 
33% of the inbound market. They are coming to North Devon because they can do your experience. And finally, in the teal color at the top, 41% and 50% chose the destination first, and then they found the experience that they're doing. So these are the people booking on local tourist board websites and different, you know, Airbnb cottages or different places like that, and, and they're or, or a local B&B, and they're staying and they're thinking, what can I do tomorrow? What can I do next week? Uh, you know, um, in, in the desk, you know, before they uh, sorry, what, before they're visiting that destination. So they're thinking about what they can do once they have chosen to visit the North Devon area. So it's really interesting. Three different ways, um, two different markets. Um, this is all before the pandemic. So actually thinking about, you know, being having your experience bookable is really important because back in 2019. 65% of the domestic audience, so people here in the UK, were pre-booking their experience before leaving home, way before they were visiting or, or, or reaching the destination. Now, as you know, um, with the pandemic, we've all got very used to booking to go to the restaurant, to have the beer, have a beer in the pub, etc. Um, so actually that's 65% now. I think it's going to be right up in the 90s because uh, we've all got used to, you know, you, you know, you book to go to the National Trust property, to go to the gardens, what have you. You, We've all got used to being, um, to doing things in, 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 to be bookable. So actually having your product, having your experience bookable is even more important than it ever has been. So how do people find out about your experience? And now it's important to have your own website and have your experience on your own website and make that experience bookable. But is that gonna be enough to bring people from all across the country and around the world to know about your experience? Do you have enough marketing budget to actually uh, put, you know, to make sure that you're top on Google, um, you're ranking really high? Are you gonna get enough traffic to your website? That's a big question that we ask many businesses. And, and we always encourage you to have your own website and be bookable on the website. I'm not just talking about email us for more information. That turns a lot of people off these days. They want to click, they want to see all the information, they want to know when it starts, when it finishes, uh, how many people and the price. And they want that button to click and book and that to be instant and come to you as a booking. So having your website is important, but there are other ways to actually take your uh, experience to market. And here are just some of them. I should say there are many other ways, but these are some of the key uh, and most popular ways in the UK at the moment. And that's called online travel agents, or as we know them as OTAs. So you might be familiar with some of these brands on the screen now. I'm gonna take you through one by one each of these and talk to you about how they work. So the first one, one of the most recognized brands there is a visitor, a visitor, a trip advisor, which is also known in America as Viator. So Viator is actually the group that owns um, TripAdvisor. So when we're talking about TripAdvisor, we're also talking about Viator. They are the biggest players in experiential tourism in the world. Most people around the world go to TripAdvisor to book an experience. Here in the UK, we think very much about TripAdvisor going, going to a restaurant and leaving a review, going to a hotel and leaving a review. And obviously that's a massive uh, area of their business, but also a huge part of their business is their experiences. And if you go to their website, there's a section called things to do, and that's their experiences basically. And you can directly onboard to TripAdvisor or Viator and put your experiences on there. So you put all your information, you put your pictures, uh, all the details and the length of time, how many people you can take, uh, all of that goes in. And then you add your availability. So these are your dates and times of when your experience will run. Then once somebody, when a customer books on TripAdvisor or Viator, you will then have that booking coming through. There is a commission in there. No, there's nothing, there's nothing, uh, you know, it's not, not free. We're not just talking about a listing. We're talking about a transfer of money and a, a transfer of a booking. Now, visitor, uh, uh, sorry, TripAdvisor and Viator take 25%. Now, that might be quite alarming to some businesses and some individuals on the call today, but you will have to pay um, for these kind of uh, online 
tourism and sorry, online travel agents. But these guys are going to be doing the marketing for you. You're not spending out hundreds and thousands of pounds on your Google uh, to get your website marketed. These guys are reaching a global audience that you simply cannot reach by yourself. So whatever size your business, these guys are well known for getting visitors. So if you want to be successful, you're going to have to take that £25 hit, so 25% hit. So you need to factor that in now into your costs. It's don't think about it as, um, as, as uh, I've, got, I've got to add on commission. Think about your commission now. Think about that 20, and, and if you are selling through TripAdvisor, plan that in your pricing right now. Go ahead and think about that now and not at the end, because all of these will have service rates. They'll all have commissions um, because they're doing the job for you. They're gonna be marketing your experiences. And also that's really important as a small business as you haven't got time to spend hours each day, each week on marketing your experiences. Yes, you can do some social media, Facebook and Instagram, and that's great. You know, we really encourage that because you can get some direct bookings and you're not taking that 25% uh, off your experience, but you're not also going to reach the same level of people. The next one is Airbnb. So again, lots of people know Airbnb for renting out holiday cottages or apartments, et cetera, or, or rooms. Um, they have a section on there called Airbnb experiences. Um, so when you book an experience, when you book a, a, a room or, or a cottage, it, you're then told on your email or on the app that down the road or you know five miles away is this fantastic experience. Would you like to book it? So again, they're reaching an audience that have they know they're in the destination and they're going to be there at the same time when your experiences might be running. So Airbnb, it's the second biggest player in the marketplace. It's not particularly well known um, outside of cities um, for experiences. So if you look in London, you'll find loads of different experiences. If you look in Barcelona or San Francisco, lots of experiences. They are taking a much longer time to actually reach regional England. They're taking a longer time to actually go off and actually uh, find more authentic experiences in those local places, but you might really benefit from that. Now, there is a word of warning with Airbnb. I love Airbnb and I've used Airbnb for a long time, but you need to understand before you sign up or as you sign up, that Airbnb um, will ask you to run your experience exclusivity, ex exclusively. So um, Airbnb prefers for you to have all Airbnb customers on that experience. So you can't take a booking from your own website and one from TripAdvisor and mix it with Airbnb. That's not, that's against their kind of terms, conditions. Uh, they want their guests on their experiences. One of those reasons is because of the insurance. So what, when you're paying Airbnb for their, their commission, you are paying for your, their public liability insurance to cover you on your experience and their guests. So, TripAdvisor and Viator and all the other brands of the online travel agents we see before us are actually um, not going to cover you. You'll need to have your own public liability. And in most cases, we all have that anyway. But what Airbnb is saying and what they're doing is actually, if you're an individual just running this or you're a business, we want to protect you and our guests. We want to cover that experience. So you have to qualify first of all. So you put forward your experience and then they check it. Their commission is 20%, um, but it is worth pointing out, you know, you, you need to be kind of bookable for Airbnb. So there's ways around that where you can have um, you know, Airbnb days. So some businesses I know will say, actually, on a Tuesday, I take all my bookings from Airbnb because I know they're all Airbnb guests. Or on a Saturday, I'm going to take all my Airbnb guests and the rest of the week, I'm going to be taking, you know, TripAdvisor, etc. So there are ways around it. Airbnb are quite strict on uh, the amount of people that you have on your experience. So you can take anything from one up to what have you. Um, but if you get one person booking your experience, you are then locked in to run that experience. Now, for some businesses, that's absolutely fine. And I have run my spawn experience with one people quite a few times at the very beginning. And um, and I scratched my head the first time, but actually 
that one person, especially if this is the first time you're doing that, is really important because they are not just one person on your experience. They're going to leave you a fantastic review because they've had the best experience ever. So that review is worth a lot. So actually, don't always discount that if you're in this isn't just Airbnb. If you're only getting one book in on, on your own website, for example, you know, people do want to travel on their own. So you don't want to, you know, not allow them to come because they're simply on their own. That's that's not right. Um, but you'll also be thinking, well, it's not going to I'm not going to get a profit out of this. You know, I'm just about covering my costs. But do think about that review, especially if it's your first time that you run your experience. Um, I've just um uh, my first guest on my experience was from Moscow and funny enough I've just been talking to her actually today um, and she she was the first person I was on Airbnb five years ago and she booked my experience um, I had no reviews I had no evidence how good it was or anything like that and she took the gamble she booked my experience uh, we had a fantastic time kept in touch five years on and she uh, left me a brilliant review and after that I then have, you know, 100 bookings because of that one review, you know, over the next year or two. And that's how that's how it works. So, you know, Airbnb does have that rule and you need to factor that in. But like all these things, you know, you need to read the terms and conditions. Booking.com um, is really late to the market of experiential tourism. They're more well known for holidays and booking those kind of hotels and stuff. Um, their commission is 25 percent. Unmissable England, that's my business, that's my organisation. We are tiny compared to these big boys of online travel agents, but we're a really specialist. We specialise in that regional English uh, experience. We promote uh, in the UK. Also, we do a lot of marketing in America. So, um, you know, on our social media channels, we, we do direct targeting of the types of guests that we're looking for. So we, we tend to uh, promote our experiences more to couples, uh, whether that's um, if they're um, who, who haven't got children or before they might have children or about who are kind of that retire, early retirement age and going into retirement and, and retired. Um, so we tend to go for the couples market. That might be really good for you. That might kind of be a connection thing. Actually, that's the type of audience that I'm looking for. I'm not going down the family market um, and that might be for you. So we are um, less in our commission because we're smaller. We're 15%. Or if you're a charity or not for profit, then we're 10% as well. But we do offer you a friendly face and we will help you with your experience in de designing it and developing it. And we're always at the end of the phone as well. So we're not just a, an email box. We are, we are real people. Um, then we've got Expedia. Uh, again, one of the big boys out there uh, and well known uh, for holidays and hotels. Again, they're quite late to the uh, experiential tourism market. They have a section on their website called Local Expert. 25% again on, on their experiences. You are going to reach a global audience with Expedia again. Um, it's one to watch as well. Get your guide. Uh, really good for tours. Um, so you might be a tour company already. Uh, and well known, uh, we you know might be already using Get Your Guide. They their commission is based on the size of your business and how how well your business and your experience do. So it's more negotiable, um, but you might find that's a good route for you. As I said, this is just some of the online travel agents out in the marketplace. There are many more. There's many more specialist ones as well. We always advise independently that it's good to be in as many shop windows as possible. So you don't want your product just in one place. Try it in a number of different places. And the really good thing about online travel agents is that you can try these and then you can stop them, come off them. You're not locked into some horrendous five, 10 year contract or anything like that. If you haven't got any bookings, you can just delete your account and come off it. I would actually you know, message them and, and, and talk to them first before you do that and just to say why. But you can actually um, remove yourself from that. So you're not locked in. You, you don't pay anything to join these online travel agents. They're free to sign up. And I encourage you to have a little dabble. Have, have a look. We, we would love to have you on Unmissable England, of course. Use it to actually have a look at how it works um, because there's these platforms behind these websites and apps um, and it will ask you all the important questions about your experience like duration pricing things like that and it will help you get to think about 
what you need to think, figure out about your experience. As long as you've not got bookings, as I said, you can come off them. As soon as you've got bookings, then you are, you know, you're, you're contracted then, uh, you're agreeing to those terms and conditions. Um, so you need to obviously honor those bookings um, as well. But at any point you can, you can you know, reconsider uh, any of this. So it's good to be as in many uh, options as possible, but it's also good to have your own website to work with local tourist boards. And I know Sarah will be saying shortly about uh, what Torridge and the Biosphere are doing in actually with their own app um, to have your experiences listed. Um, so that's really good marketing that will help drive bookings as well. So there's lots of different things other than online travel agents. And we'll spend a lot longer in our actual physical workshop looking at bookability and how, how you go about it. Uh, just a few more uh, things to mention before we come to the end of the webinar today, uh, and that's thinking about your costs versus your profits. Um, I encourage you to go away now and actually uh, put together a really simple spreadsheet and go through everything it will cost you to run your experience. Think about your time in, in actually planning out the experience. If you're having to buy um, a pasty before the experience and pick up that pasty. Think about you know all of that, all the admin. Think about the cost of the pasty and how much it costs per person. Think about any entrance fees to venues or boat hire, any staffing resource, anything like that. Include it in your first column, and then work out what that cost is or all that amount of time you're putting into that, and then work out how much that will be per person per group of four, per group of eight, et cetera, whatever's um, relevant to your experience in business. That will help you then work out how much you need to charge per person or per a group, um, depending on how you'd like to structure your experience. So um, that's a real take, good takeaway uh, thing, you know, spreadsheet, orders a bit of paper and a pen, and actually just start of, start of working out what your costs will be as you start thinking about your experience. And if you bring that along to the uh, workshops as well, we can help you with that. So um, a few things to consider um, between now and the next workshop, and we really hope to see you at the next sessions. Um, think about insurance. Um, if you're going down the Airbnb route, then you won't need to think about insurance because you're getting that insurance as a part of that 20%. But if you're going to be having selling your experience on your own website or on your local tourist board website or with any other online travel agent, you will need public liability insurance and you will need to speak to your, your broker or your insurance provider and actually talk through the type of experience that you're doing, making sure you're fully covered. If you are working with any food and drink, you'll then need to have, obviously have the relevant licensing. If you are transferring guests in your experience from A to B to C, you will need to speak to your local district council, obviously Torridge District Council, and look on the website as well to make sure that you are not breaking any rules or laws in actually moving guests around. So there's quite, in each district, there are quite strict rules about how you taxi guests around. So you might need to collaborate with a local minibus company or, or somebody with a license to do that. Um, or you might hopefully might be on foot, or you might be using an e-bike or a cycle or a boat or what have you to actually move people around, or it might all be in the one place, but you will need to do that research before. Uh, you also need to think about food hygiene certificates as well. If you're actually um, producing the food, obviously you'll need that and have your kitchen, if it's at home or your business obviously licensed. If you are like Rich, who we saw in Sussex and the South Downs, he's simply putting together that picnic um, he's got a food hygiene certificate. Even that he's not physically making the food, he, he's just making sure it's kept in the right temperature and all those things. So going online, uh, and again, there's more advice on the Torridge um, District Council website, you can find out about food hygiene certificates. It's about £25 roughly to have one of those. Again, it's good to include in your own website on the online travel agent website to show you that you're serious about looking after your guests. Then, uh, if you are thinking about signing up to online travel agents, the OTAs, read through all their information. Uh, make sure that you, before signing up, you understand what you're signing up to. Again, the risk is quite low because 
you, you can come off them. You're not signed up to any lengthy contracts and paying lots of money. Uh, but as you sign up, before you actually make your experiences live and bookable, just read through those experiences and ask questions. Uh, don't be afraid to ask questions so you really understand. Don't you don't want to be in a position where you're actually thinking, oh, I have to deliver this experience and it wasn't what I it wasn't when I wanted it to be, and all these different things. You know, make sure you're you have a full understanding before. And really think about your audience, think about your market. So are you, are you just going for a local regional market or do you actually want to have a slice of the cake of visitors coming from across the UK or maybe even abroad? So think about where those customers might book, how they might find you and the types of experiences that they might want to do. Um, so, for example, there's lots of really good research and we can share this in our workshop um, about the German audience, you know, who typically like to hire a car and come across from the, the, the channel tunnel or use the, um, uh, the Eurostar uh, and then uh, use public transport. There's quite a higher percentage. There's lots of information on the Visit Britain website about different markets, uh, but they love nature experiences. They love those kind of connections with wildlife, bird spotting and those kind of things. And you might say, actually, you know, my, my, my experience is for everybody. It is for a domestic audience. But I would love to reach some of that, to, uh, that German audience and actually, you know, think about how I can reach those audiences working with different online travel agents or, or just having some German information on my own website, uh, you know, in German. I could be doing that with Google Translate. So it's good to think about these things and think about who your audience is and uh, have that pricing plan that really includes that commission, the online travel agents fees and the service fees. Um, when you're distributing your experiences in the marketplace, there will be fees. So you need to think about them first of all. And finally, you need to have availability because your availability is your visibility. If you don't have dates on your experience, how can your guest customers book? How will they know anything about you? Uh, a lot of these online travel agents will only display your experience if you have bookable dates and times. So you need to have times when you do it. We're not talking about events. Events happen you know, as one-offs or once or twice a year. We're talking about experiences. Experiences run regularly because guests come regularly. They come all year round these days. They're not just coming through the summer. So you want to have some experiences, again, not just at the weekend, what about midweek? And of course, there's lots to think about in resourcing and staffing in, and, and your own availability. And in the next workshop, I'll give you some really handy tips in how you actually come uh, uh, make some really crafty decisions about your availability. I got some ideas about how you can do that if you're a really small uh, business as well. So some handy tips there to take away. A question just came in, will it be available to download? Of course not. Yes, of course it will be, because there's so much information in there to take away. Um, we're recording it as well, so you can re-watch and go back to it. And really importantly, yes, uh, Adam, you can have a look at it because there's so much information uh, we wanted to share with you this morning. But hopefully we'll see you and, and everybody else on the next actual physical workshop uh, coming up, which takes place here we go, our next steps. Um, it takes place on the 24th or the 25th of March. And um, there'll be some details coming out about that. So your next steps from today is very much think about the, your story. Think about the stories um, in your part of North Devon and part of your uh, part of the Torridge district. Think about those different nature, wildlife, rural, coastal stories. Uh, we want to hear about them um, and we will hopefully see you on the 24th and 25th of March. I'm gonna welcome Sarah back uh, and uh, we're going to um, ask, well, answer, I should say, any of your questions that you might have um, this morning. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, uh, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I particularly like the uh, getting the conversations between yourself and also your visitors that are coming over, maybe from abroad and just having that, you know, the, the the conversation and changing of the the different cultures between between the two people i think that that's brilliant um, some of the best experience is actually when you have a mixed group of people so you might get sure. one one person booked because they live on their own and that's the, how they do their holidays and then you might get a couple and then you might get another couple and they might come from all different places in the world and actually 
that's already an experience because they're sharing about, you know, this is what I do and stuff. And, and you sit back and you're like, oh, I've learned so much as yeah. an experienced host. So it, there's so much value in, in, in this for everybody. Absolutely. Brilliant. Um, OK, so do we have any questions from anybody? Thanks, Chris, for your uh, glad you glad you like the presentation. As I said, there was a lot in there and uh, we will do a recap on all of that um, in the session uh, and then it's very much activity based uh, session in, in our workshop. So we will work practically on, on actually looking at experiences and using practical solutions and examples as well. So uh, we will we will reca re recap um, a lot of this as well. So it really does go in. <laughs> <laughs> so the. Um... The practical workshops and the in-person workshops will be um, on the 24th, Thursday, the 24th of March. That's going to be at Smitham Holiday Park in Little Torrington. Um, and or you can do uh, Friday, the 25th at uh, Stern Lodge in Appledore. And that they are the venues. They are three hours long, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, and Chris will be providing even more information on um, on what we can be doing here in our UNESCO biosphere and, and across uh, Northern Devon to try and um, put some nature experiences together and, and really try and capture um, the essence of, of what, what happens in this area. I think we've had some more Yeah, we've got, we've got Vicky. She has a historic wooden boat. I'm yes, already told. This sounds brilliant. Uh, they're restoring it. Um, do you think folk would like? To, yes, yes. Can I come already? <laughs> yeah, already. You, you, you know, you've got the historic wood wooden boat. Um, yes, yes. I'd love to find out more. Hopefully, we'll get to meet you on the twenty fourth or twenty fifth, and um, we can spend some time on looking at that and going behind the scene. You know, talking about how you can go behind the scenes of that. Cause that yeah. sounds that sounds exactly the type of experiences that we're looking for. Yeah, that would be brilliant, Vicky. Um, when you first signed up, you're obviously one of our biosphere business partners as well. Um, and I was thinking this, with, you know, with with your boat, Britannia. I, I think this would be an amazing experience for people to to come and have a look about how you're restoring it and in, and help as well, help you to restore it. I think and get hands on with it. I think would be amazing. Oh. oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Okay, so, uh, okay, that's a shame, Vicky, that you can't come to the workshops, but um, I mean, if anybody else is available from Britannia Sailing Trust, then yeah, absolutely send them along on your behalf. Ah. Uh, Nicola's questions about uh, Sandy Toxvic and the extraordinary escapes. Um, there's been so many programs I was saying earlier on on telly uh, visiting all, all different parts of the UK and particular northern northern De Devon as well um, and mm. it, it just gives great exposure but people are looking for these experiences to deal with that all the celebrities do that we, yeah. we can't book ourselves you know it's very limited yeah. you know um, so this is what what the project's all about. Mm. I haven't seen that one Nicola but I will check it out um, uh, but yeah I've been watching recently um oh what's his name the guy who does um the chase bradley walsh and his oh, yeah. son they've been yeah. going all, all around different countries doing different things that you wouldn't normally get to do and and yeah it, it's brilliant okay any more questions does anybody need to know anything before we head off what time are we on Brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that, Chris. Um, and yeah, I will be, um, what I'll do, everybody that's on the call, I will just drop an email uh, at some point, probably by early next week. Um, and I'll probably give the send the recording link in there as well so that you've got that. And I'll also send some other links that might be of interest for you as well. So um, you will be hearing from me shortly. But thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. <laughs>